Welcome to this week's online message from Kenmore Community Church. I'm Pastor Mark Rogers. In just a few moments, we'll continue our study of 1 Thessalonians. Today we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. So I invite you to take your Bible. Make sure you've got it close by and open to that passage so you can follow along as I read it here in just a few minutes. Let's begin with prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come before you today thankful for your goodness. Thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you uh, for the many blessings you've given to us. And uh, Father, we are so blessed to be your beloved sons and daughters. And we thank you for adopting us into your family. Thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. Thank you for the new covenant. And thank you for your word so that we can learn more about you and how you would have us live. And, and uh, we are just blessed by all of these things. Each of us, Lord, comes before you today with various concerns on our hearts and minds uh, for ourselves as well as for others. And we want to lay all of those concerns at the foot of the cross and ask that you would intervene in each, each situation, whatever the need might be. I know that um, some of us are praying for our own health needs. Uh, some of us are praying for the health needs of others, and we know you're the great uh, physician and can do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. So we pray that you would bring your healing touch to bear in each situation as is needed. And some of us, Lord, are uh, fearful, we're anxious, we're depressed, we're discouraged. We need to uh, have our spirits lifted, and so we pray again that by your spirit, Lord, you would encourage those that need encouragement today. Some people are in need. A physical need, help paying rent, help putting food on the table, maybe more work or a job to begin with, whatever it might be. Uh, we know, Lord, that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider, and so again, we pray that you would provide for those needs. Here at Kenmore Community Church, we want to remember our families of the week. We pray for Jonathan Jolly. Thank you, Lord, that at long last he's been able to get into a public housing situation, subsidized rent situation, and we just pray for him as he transitions this week to that new place of living. We pray for Marcus Cragness, that you would bless and encourage him. We pray for Debbie Ledoux, and thank you for her work in providing uh, flowers uh, throughout the spring and summer and fall from her garden uh, for our service each week, Lord. And uh, we pray that you would encourage her and just help her to know how much you love her and care about her. And we pray for Luke from the youth group. We pray for his spiritual growth and development. I know he had a birthday just recently. And so we, we pray that you would encourage him, Lord, as he is attending high school, help him to show himself to be a student approved unto you. And today for our mission focus, we're praying for our camp in Ravensdale, Washington, Lake Retreat. We thank you for this camp. We thank you for uh, how many people it has affected throughout the years through the various camps and conferences that have been held there. And so we pray that uh, that legacy would continue with those that are currently uh, attending the camp. And we pray for the Adelphia Bible School, uh, discipleship school that meets there, for the new group of students that have just begun their studies. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would draw them close to you and help them come to understand what your plan and purpose is for their life. And now, Lord, as we turn to studying First Thessalonians once again, we're asking that uh, by your Spirit you would illumine our understanding of uh, the, the verses we're going to be looking at today so that we can see uh, what they mean and how they apply to each one of our lives. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I've been sharing with you now throughout our study of First Thessalonians, the theme of this book is uh, living uh, to please, uh, well, well, living faithfully in preparation for Christ's return. And so we're going to focus a little bit more on Christ's return today as we study uh, the first part of chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now, last week we looked at uh, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, which dealt with the question, what happens after death? And more specifically, where are our loved ones? Will we see them uh, again? And Paul answered that uh, question by explaining that those who have died in the Lord are with the Lord, and they will be part of the great day of resurrection. And if you have trust in Christ, then we can have hope in the face of death. Today we're going to look at the question, what will happen at the end of the world? Will there be a day of reckoning? 
And if so, how can we pre prepare for it? And 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11 gives us instructions um, about that, that the day of the Lord will come, and it tells us how we can prepare, how we can get ready uh, for that day. So if you have your Bible in front of you, uh, follow along now as I read from 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not re need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. Well, in this passage, as I mentioned, we learn about the importance of being ready for the second coming of Christ. So let's talk about the necessity of walking in readiness. We see this in verses 1 through 5. Paul tells us that the day of the Lord will come. The second coming of Jesus is one of the most repeated teachings in all of Scripture. Uh, Paul was well aware of um, this, and he explained to his readers that they should be perfectly aware that Jesus was coming again. In fact, he implies that they should be so aware of the second coming of Christ that he shouldn't even have to write to them again about it. It should be obvious. It reminds me of, of an illustration I heard a long time ago about a, uh, a tourist who was driving through West Texas and stopped at a little mini-mart, and uh, he observed a, a piece of string hanging from a sign that said, a weather forecaster. So he went in and spoke to the clerk at the mini-mart and said, you know, how on earth can you tell the weather from a little piece of string hanging off that sign outside? And the clerk said, well, it's easy if, if the... If the if, the, uh, str if the, the little piece of rope is wiggling, we know it's windy. If, we, if it's wet, we know it's raining. Uh, if it's frozen, we know that it's cold. And, and if it's white or has some white on it and it's frozen, we know it's been snowing. And if it's gone, we know there's been a tornado. Uh, so uh, the Minimart clerk basically was saying, you know, it should be obvious how you tell uh, the weather from a piece of rope hanging uh, off that sign. And the fact of Jesus' return ushering in the day of the Lord uh, should be obvious for those who are students of God's word. And th then Paul tells us that the day of the Lord will come uh, when it comes, that uh, is the time, the day of the Lord is the time when Christ will return to judge the world. The day of the Lord is an expression used throughout the Bible that refers to God's judgment and the defeat of his adversaries, as well as the salvation of his people. And throughout history, there have been many periods of time that might be called the day of the Lord. But all of those, day, all of those days uh, look forward to the big day at the end of history. Uh, they're like the preliminary fights leading up to the, the main event. The final day of the Lord is when God will judge the world and punish the nations once and for all uh, for their wickedness. And the day of the Lord begins with the second coming of Christ. Paul tells us that the day of the Lord will be unexpected. No one knows the day or the hour of Christ's return. Therefore, it's impossible and it's wrong to speculate about the day and the hour, the date and time of Christ's return. It will be like a thief in the night, indicating that it's suddenness and it's uh, that it's sudden and it's un unexpected, um, and it will be somewhat of a surprise. Jesus himself said in Matthew twenty four thirty six, "No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father." Paul tells us more about the day of the Lord, that unbelievers will be caught by surprise. 
Uh, they refuse to listen to God's word and heed his warnings. Uh, people will be going about their daily activities. They'll be eating and drinking, going to work, busy with the world's affairs. And they'll be thinking everything is safe and secure and never considering that God's judgment is just around the corner. Judgment will come on them, on them suddenly like labor pains on a pregnant woman. It will be destructive and there will be no escape. Believers should not be surprised at this, Paul says. We're sons and daughters of the light. We do not walk in darkness when it comes to future events. We know that Jesus is going to return, and it could be any day, so we need to be ready and live our lives accordingly. Uh, Colossians 1.13 tells us, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. In the Bible, uh, we need to remember that darkness represents ignorance and spiritual blindness and wickedness. As sons of the light, we all have the blessings and privileges associated with being uh, sons and daughters of the king. So Paul tells us here, we're children of the light. The day of the Lord shouldn't surprise us. And I just want to take a moment to remind you about who you are in Christ. If you have placed your faith in and trust in Jesus Christ, you have a new identity. You're a different person. You've become someone you never were before. Many of us struggle with this because we know how far short we fall. And Satan is a, a sniper who likes to throw his fiery darts at Christians and get us to doubt our relationship to God. And I wonder if some of us are more defined by the world and, you know, the thinking of darkness than we are by the Word, what the Word teaches about who we are in Christ as children of light. So let me give you a brief overview of how God views you. Uh, maybe close your eyes and allow these 20 truths to permeate your mind and, and percolate in your spirit here. But this is what the scripture says about who we are in Christ as children of the light. Uh, you're a child of God. You're a friend of Jesus. You've been justified and redeemed. You will never be condemned. You've been set free from the law of sin and death. You are a joint heir with Christ. You've been accepted in Christ. And you're called to be a saint. In fact, the Bible calls you a saint. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're a new creation in Christ. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You have been forgiven. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You're seated in the heavenly places with Christ. You are God's workmanship. You're a citizen of heaven. You will have all your needs supplied by God. You have been made complete in Christ. And you are loved and chosen by God. So as children of the light, we do not walk in the dark when it comes to future events because God has revealed them to us. So remember who you are. You are a child of light and uh, you're not walking in darkness. You are walking in light. So you can be ready for Christ's return. You know about Christ's coming. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know that he is going to return. And when he returns, the day of the Lord, the main event, the final, final day of the Lord will take place. Now, Paul tells us in verses 5 through 8 how to uh, walk in readiness, the conditions of walking in readiness for Christ's return. He tells us that we must live daily with an attitude of watchfulness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. A soldier is commanded to stay alert on his post. So we must, as Christians, Paul instructs us to watch and be vigilant. His command is in the present tense, which means this must be a continual practice for the Christian. It's a matter of attitude, always being on the ready, always being on the lookout uh, and being watchful for Christ's return. In these days of uncertainty, how many of us think about being ready for Christ's return on a daily basis? 
I think if you're like me, we often get distracted by the busyness of life, and we don't, uh, you know, give being ready for Christ's return much thought. And it kind of reminds me of a, a couple by the name of Jeff and Janelle Youngbluss and their first date. Now, keep in mind, this couple got married, but this was the story of their first date. Janelle was expecting Jeff to uh, show up. She was dressed and she was ready for the date. She waited patiently for an hour for him to show up and finally gave up. She finally, uh, you know, figured out that he had stood her up and uh, she went to the bathroom, took off her makeup and slipped into her pajamas and grabbed a pint of ice cream and sat down in front of the TV and was just eating away at her ice cream. And after two hours passed, the doorbell rang and guess who showed up? It was Jeff. And he took one look at her and said, I'm two hours late and you're still not ready? So this is the idea, you know, I think early on when we learn about Christ's return, we, we are watchful, we're thinking, wow, it could happen any time now. But as time goes on and it doesn't happen and it doesn't happen, we kind of get a little, uh, um, you know, apathetic and uh, lazy about it. But when it comes to Christ's return, Paul is telling us that we should live daily with an attitude of watchfulness. And then we also must live daily with the discipline of self-control. Uh, the Apostle Paul is warning us that we must not allow anything within our lives that will influence our alertness. He, he uh, pictures those who are portrayed, uh, who are living in darkness, he, he portrays them as sleeping and as being drunk. In this case, sleep and drunk, uh, drunkenness picture someone who is not in touch with or in control of his or her own life. When we're asleep, we're pretty much out of touch with the world around us, except for our dreams. Uh, the drunk has lost control of his or her ability to make wise decisions and coordinate responses. And people who live in expectation of Christ's return are likened to... Um, uh, expectation of Christ coming are uh, likened to sleepers and drunkards not really in touch with the present and ultimate reality. Uh, those folks who don't live in expectation of Christ's return are pictured as sleepers and drunkards. Let me just be clear about that. People who don't live in expectation of that, that they're not really in touch with present or ultimate reality. So living in light of Christ's promised return is like living in the light and living in sobriety as opposed to living in darkness and living in drunkenness. We must live daily with the protection of God's armor as well, the Apostle Paul tells us here. He says, but since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting our faith, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. He tells us this in verse 8. Even as the Apostle Paul thinks of life in the light and in sobriety, he is gripped with the reality that our life until Jesus comes is still going to be a battle. We need to put on our spiritual armor. Uh, we gird for battle with, with Paul's favorite trilogy, uh, faith, love, and hope. Faith and love are, are like a breastplate that protects our heart. Faith toward God and love for God's people. Hope is a sturdy helmet that protects the mind. Unbelievers fix their minds on the things of this world, while believers set their attention on things above. So that hope is like a helmet uh, for us. It's the hope that salvation gives to us. Now Paul gets more explicit about the armor of God in Ephesians uh, chapter 6. And I thought it would be good at this point just to, to read that to you. Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, verses uh, 10 through 18. You can turn there if you want to, um, but I'll turn there here and, and just read those for you. So uh, this is, again, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. 
Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So there Paul gets a little more explicit about the armor of God. We've talked about that a little bit before. But again, if you want to be ready, uh, you, you're going to need to uh, put on the armor of God uh, on a daily basis because as we are waiting for Christ's return, our life is a battle. We, had, we have an adversary, we have an enemy, the devil, who would like nothing more than to discourage us, to get us to turn away from Christ, certainly get us to stop telling others about Jesus, get us discouraged in our faith, and so uh, we need to put on that armor of God. The third thing Paul tells us here is about the blessings of walking in readiness. Uh, he tells us that there's comfort from knowing that we will not experience God's wrath because we have received salvation. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Now the Bible tells us again, we have not been appointed to suffer wrath, meaning the final judgment where we would be condemned to hell for all eternity. For we have been saved. God has saved us. Salvation is a free gift from God. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tell us that for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So those two verses tell us that our salvation is a free gift from God. But we have to receive it. We have to open it. We receive it by putting our faith and trust in Jesus, by accepting the fact that uh, Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, and uh, putting our faith and trust in him. And again, that salvation is based on the life and death of Jesus, Jesus' death on the cross for our sins. And it keeps us, as I mentioned, from having to face God's judgment. Paul tells us here that we have not, those who are in Christ, have not been appointed to suffer God's wrath. We don't have to worry about God's judgment upon us in the future if we put our faith and trust in Christ. And it assures, our salvation assures us that we will be with Christ forever, whether we live or die. Remember last week, uh, the people were concerned about, you know, what, ha what has happened to our loved ones who have already died in Christ? Uh, will we see them again? And Paul says, yes, Christ will bring them back uh, with him when he comes. And then he went on to say, and those of you who are still alive don't have to worry either because you will be caught up to join them uh, in the air. So we can have peace uh, from knowing uh, that, that, that we will not experience God's wrath because we have received salvation. And Paul tells us also another blessing of walking in readiness is uh, peace from knowing that we are ready for the coming of Christ. Uh, we can look forward to Christ's coming with excitement and in expectancy instead of fear and dread because we know we're ready. We've put our faith and trust in Christ and uh, we have received salvation from him. Well, there may be some listening today who, after hearing this message, you don't have that comfort, you don't have that peace about the second of coming of Christ because you have not yet made yourself ready for it. And if that's your situation, you can settle that matter today simply by putting your faith and trust in Christ. How do you do that? You acknowledge and accept the fact that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. And as a free gift, he offers that salvation to you. And you accept it by putting your faith and trust in him, by repenting, confessing your sin and repenting of your sin, and basically telling him from this day forward, you are going to uh, submit to his reign and rule in your life. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, 
He sends the Holy Spirit to dwell in you, and uh, you become a new creation in Christ. So that's how you get ready. If you're not ready, that's how you can get ready, and I'd encourage you to take that step today. If you've already put your faith and trust in Jesus, then I encourage you to live it out by walking in faith, hope, and love, by putting on that full armor of God and uh, continue to fulfill the plan and purpose that God has for your life. Use your gifts, talents, and abilities in service to Him. Uh, loving God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Loving your neighbor uh, as yourself. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you're doing that and, and just kind of being watchful, aware that Christ's return could come uh, at any day, uh, you, are, you will be ready. You will be ready. And uh, when he returns, he will see that you have been about his business. So uh, Paul tells us finally in this passage to encourage your brothers and sisters and build them up. Uh, being ready for Christ's return uh, is a good way to encourage and build each other up. We can say, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you looking for that day? Are you busy being about the Lord's business while you are waiting. These are ways that we can encourage one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for your word. Thank you for what we've learned today from 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 1 through 11 about being ready. Uh, Lord, um, we, we need to remember that the day of the Lord is coming, uh, that Jesus has said he will return, and we are called to be ready. Uh, we should it should not take us by surprise like it takes unbelievers by surprise and and so we need to be living as children of light uh, understanding the truths that you have revealed to us and um, and and therefore uh, we can uh, put our faith and trust in Christ know that Jesus will return and could return at any time and so we want to be about your business Lord so help us to be faithful in living for you and remaining ready for your coming. Uh, and we pray, Lord, if anybody is listening today, I pray that if anybody's listening who is not ready for your return, I pray today would be the day they put their faith and trust in you. They confess and repent of their sins and uh, surrender to your reign and rule in their lives. And again, those of us who have already made that decision, help us to continue to live faithfully using the gifts, talents, and abilities you've given us to continue to be about your business. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.